everyone. My name is Jacob Bongers, and uh, I am extremely happy to be giving this talk. Just a few things before we start. I want to thank Matthew and the other members of the Brown Bag C Committee for inviting me to give this talk. I sincerely hope that everybody is doing as well as they can during these incredibly challenging times. And lastly, uh, a final note, uh, a fun fact about me uh, is that I'm a person who stutters. Rest assured, um, this does not mean that the talk will last th three hours, but, uh, but it, it does mean that you will hear, hear me stutter every now and then. So let's get started. I'll now talk about my work on mortuary practices in the middle Chincha Valley, Peru. These practices are connected to two tomb types, large mausoleums known as cholpas and small fieldstone lined cysts. Our C14 dates, which I present later, indicate that both these tomb types were used in the LIP, the Inca period, and the colonial period. During the LIP, a complex polity known as the Chincha Kingdom dominated the Chincha Valley. The Inca brought the Chincha under their control in the 15th century. The Spanish came to Peru in 1532 CE and established their rule over several years in the colonial period. Here, I ask, to what extent and for what purpose did local peoples transform mortuary practices during periods of conquest? Who were the dead and where did they come from? I view mortuary practices as political strategies and see imperial conquests as a means by which societies are profoundly reshaped. For this research, several methods and types of data are integrated, ranging from survey to ancient DNA to investigate a mortuary landscape of over 500 tombs. We have produced a carbon-14 based chronology that demonstrates how local mortuary practices developed from the LIP to the colonial period. I will make three main points here. First, tomb use and treatment of the dead transformed during the Inca and colonial periods. Second, the Inca moved non-local peoples from the north Peruvian coast to Chincha. Third, mortuary transformations and the resettlement of non-local peoples produced significant social change in Chincha. I will first make the case that local peoples significantly changed how they dealt with their dead under Inca and Spanish rule. I will put this research in historical context and highlight methods, findings, and theory. Then our genetic data will be woven in. I will show that North Coast peoples made their way to Chincha during the Inca period. I will end the talk with my complete interpretation for these data. The Ch Ch Chincha Kingdom was one of the largest complex polities on the South Coast during the LIP. It was likely centered at the site of Waka La Sentinella in the lower Chincha Valley, to which you can see here. The Chincha Kingdom allegedly had a population of at least 30,000 people. 
specialists such as farmers, fisher folk, and merchants lived throughout the area. Farmers planted maize. Fisher folk lived along the shoreline and worked uh, under the supervision of local lords. Merchants c c conducted maritime and overland trade. These merchants reportedly sailed to Ecuador for spondylus shells and emeralds and made, made their way to Cusco and the Titicaca Basin for camelids and gold. The Inca Empire conquered and consolidated the Chincha Kingdom in the 15th century. The Inca reorganized Chincha peoples into administrative units and seized agricultural land. Trade networks expanded and a new hierarchy in which Inca and Chincha leaders maintained power was established. The Inca built an ad administrative center seen here next to the Chincha platform mound at Huaca La Centinella. Colonial period documents describe Inca conquest as peaceful and involving no violent conflict. The Inca reportedly forged an alliance with the Chincha kingdom. The Spanish arrived in Chincha as early as AD 1533 and uh, uh, occupied the entire south coast of Peru by 1534. During this colonial period, looting of indigenous tombs was widespread in Chincha. Written sources describe the Spanish removing large sums of gold from these tombs. We also know that Chincha people suffered a great deal under Spanish rule. The population declined catastrophically from, uh, from over 30,000 documented heads of households of, of, of household in 1533 to 979 in 1583. This was due to a combination of epidemics likely smallpox or measles, reported for Peru in 1546 and 1558. And famines took place in 1539 and 1548. It is possible that cemeteries were abandoned during this turbulent time. The history of the Chincha Valley makes it a compelling case study to investigate local mortuary practices before and during the incursion of empire. Mortuary practices are a predominant form of human behavior. They refer to activities that concern the dead, tomb construction, the deposition of grave goods, and the physical treatment of dead bodies. They are complex processes that interweave culture and biology. For this reason, these practices demand a multifaceted methodology for investigation. I used a multiscalar and multidisciplinary research design to investigate a dense mortuary landscape in the middle Chincha Valley. Data on the nature, variation, and chronology of mortuary practices demonstrate mortuary transformations coincident with the Inca and Spanish conquests. Now, how did I reach this, this takeaway point? I will first discuss my methods and some findings. I conducted my work at two scales, regional and site-specific. I will start at the regional scale. We performed a survey in the middle Chincha Valley. We documented hundreds of tombs and dozens of mortuary sites. 
all of the mortuary sites have been visibly disturbed. We made several finds during the survey. Most mortuary sites in the middle Chincha Valley have ceramics that can be stylistically dated to the LIP and Inca period. And many of the ceramics are Chincha in style. Well-preserved textiles were found in several mortuary sites. Textiles served as wrappings and offerings for the dead. Four ceramic figurines were documented in the middle Chincha Valley. They were likely offerings for the dead. At least two of these are female and one bears hematite. At one mortuary site, we discovered a gourd vessel that may have contained human offerings. It is packed with soil and contains the right maxilla of a five-year-old and an adult metatarsal. These human remains contained flesh when they were placed in the gourd. The flesh was exposed long enough to allow insects to consume it because insect pupil casings were found in the vessel. Mortuary space helps enable the performance of activities involving the dead. To, to explore mortuary space in the middle Chincha Valley, I used a high accuracy GPS unit to map several mortuary sites in detail. I inputted data for attributes such as tomb type and masonry in the GPS for hundreds of tombs. All these data were imported into ArcGIS where I produced site plans of, of mortuary sites like the one that you see here. I supplemented these site plans with aerial photos that I took with a DGI Mavic Pro drone. At each of the sites, I used my drone to take dozens of top-down photos. I then imported these photos into Agisoft PhotoScan Pro, which is now called Metashape Pro. With this software, I stitched together these photos to produce larger images. These bird's eye view images can clearly show the full extent and condition of a mortuary site. I also produced DEMs, which show the elevation range for a given mortuary site. These data are useful for understanding the topography that the mortuary site is situated in. Lastly, I produced 3D models of mortuary sites. The integration of spatial data and aerial imagery produced more detailed site plans. These plans demonstrate a variety of mortuary sites in the, the, in the study area. Some sites are densely packed with tombs, while others feature plazas surrounded by tombs. This work digitally preserved looted mortuary sites from multiple perspectives and in high resolution. Tombs in the Mid-Valley display varying levels of looting and preservation. With this in mind, we performed an opportunistic C14 sample co collection through fieldwork. I divided all documented mortuary sites into spatial units situated on both the northern and southern sides of the Mid-Valley. To limit selection and spatial biases, we dated many samples of maize, human bone, human hair, and reed from cholpas and cis. 
I used Bayesian analysis to model the distributions of these dates. Now I want to shift to the site-specific scale. We collected all contents from the surface of a cholpa known as UC8 Tomb 1, built in a cemetery known as UC8. The tomb is marked by the red point on this map. We chose this tomb because of the large uh, amounts of artifacts and human bones. Thousands of human bones collected from the surface were analyzed. The tomb contains more than a hundred people. Members of distinct age and sex categories were found. This tomb contained at least some primary depositions of relatively complete bodies. This is because a relatively high percentage of smaller labile bones, such as those from hands and feet, were documented in UC8 Tomb 1. We cannot rule out that the Chulpa also had secondary depositions. At least some human remains retained flesh when they were de deposited and may have been exposed for some time in the tomb because insect casings were found. Multiple dates show that this tomb was used in the Inca period and the colonial period. However, since no colonial period finds were found uh, in the middle Ch Chancha Valley, these dates suggest that the tomb was used during the Inca period. We dug a Cholpa and two cysts at a small mortuary site known as Sector B. Only data on the Cholpa and the Eastern cyst, both, both of which are marked by red arrows, will be presented here. A couple thousand human bones were analyzed in this tomb, which has more than 30 people. Insect casings were found. Members of distinct age and sex categories were deposited in this tomb. Most of the bones are characterized as small and labile. These dates demonstrate that this tomb was used in the LIP. More than 700 bones were analyzed in the cyst marked in red. This tomb contains at least five people with different ages at death. I discuss how these people were deposited later in the talk. Two dates show that this tomb was also used in the LIP, and insect casings were also found. C14 dates from the mid Chincha Valley show continuity, abandonment, and change in tomb use and treatment of the dead through time. These patterns are critical because they demonstrate transformations in local mortuary practice that were coincident with the Inca and Spanish conquests. C14 dates reveal that Mid-Valley peoples used two tomb types, Cholpas and Cis, in the LIP. During the Inca period, however, they abandoned cis and only used chulpas. This was a major shift in how they marked their dead on the landscape. At the dawn of the colonial period, local peoples treated their dead in a new, striking way. By mounting human vertebrae on reed posts. I'll be talking more about this later. So please stay tuned. What are the differences bit, 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 between cholpas and cis? These tombs vary in their construction patterns. Cholpas are large tombs that are built with either fieldstone, poured mud, or adobe. In the Chincha Valley, 
Adobe structures are viewed as markers of Inca influence. Two dates from the Adobe Cholpa seen here fall in the Inca period. Some Cholpas are built with well-preserved roofs that would have protected the dead from the elements. Roof mats typically consist of large wooden tension beams, reeds that are tied together with twine and rope, and outer layers of plant fibers and soil. Several cholpas have openings and interior benches or platforms. These openings would have allowed people to enter these tombs. More than 200 cholpas have openings and nearly all of them have fieldstone lintels. Benches may have been used to display bodies, body parts, and offerings. We document fieldstone and earthen interior benches in a few cholpas. They are built against interior walls. Now, in some cases, cholpas were organized to form complexes with two types of flat, unroofed, and open spaces, four courts and plazas. Ceremonies likely took place in these spaces. I also find that local people's oriented cholpas toward these open spaces, which would have made the dead directly accessible during ceremonies. This is evidenced by the many cholpas that ha have openings facing forecourts and plazas. Forecourts are small spaces that are bordered on one to two sides by tombs. There are several cholpas with forecourts. Plazas are bordered on at least three sides by tombs. A few mortuary sites have plazas surrounded by cholpas. They are much larger compared to forecourts. In comparison, cis are much smaller in size compared to cholpas. They are also not as elaborately built. They lack evidence of interior benches, roofing, forecourts, plazas, and openings. They are predominantly oriented north-south, and they are all built with fieldstone. They were de designed to contain fewer people than, than cholpas. C14 dates also indicate that cholpas with red pigment date to all three time periods. This pattern suggests continuity in the use of red pigment through time. Red pigment is critical because it is one of the most widespread treatments of the dead in the Mid Valley. We documented it on human bones, textiles, and figurines in several mortuary sites in the Mid Chincha Valley. Red pigment is mostly found in cholpas. Chemical Analyses on samples from cholpas show that they contain either cinnabar or hematite, although most samples contain hematite. We discovered several human bones with red pigment in UC8 tomb 1 and the sector B cholpa. UC8 tomb 1, however, contained substantially more members of the dead with and without pigment. Data from UC8 Tomb 1 and the Sector B Cholpa show that members of different age and sex categories have pigment. Entire bodies may have been painted because different types of bones have red pigment. I also suggest that in most cases, the dead were painted sometime after soft tissues naturally decomposed. This is because among our sample of painted bones from UC8 tomb 1, a significantly high pro pro proportion lacks soft tissue. None of the samples 
have cut marks. Now I want to talk about a fascinating form of treating the dead, the mounting of human vertebrae on reed posts. Reeds with vertebrae date to the late Inca and colonial periods. None of the tombs dated to the LIP have th these remains. Mounting vertebrae on posts was a novel form of ritualized behavior. So far, we have documented 190 vertebrae on posts throughout the Chincha Valley. Reeds with vertebrae are important because they are widespread in the Chincha Valley. Nearly all of them are found in Cholpas from the Mid Valley. My colleagues Jordan Dalton and Joe Osborne have found vertebrae on posts in mortuary contexts from Las Huacas and Hawaii. Vertebrae on posts were incorporated into local mortuary practices because on survey, we documented a few wrapped in textiles or placed near disturbed textile bundles. We gathered data on a sample of vertebrae on posts. Adult and juvenile vertebrae were strung on these posts. Nearly all of them have MNI counts of one. I suggest that vertebrae were mounted on the posts sometime after disarticulation because vertebrae tend to not be in anatomical order. We assume that this practice involved a few stages. The primary deposition of the dead's remains in Cholpas, and the harvesting of reeds and inserting them through the vertebrae. We constructed a Bayesian chronological model based on this, this uh, assumption. This model incorporates dates from three vertebrae and the three reeds they were mounted on. We divided these vertebrae and reeds into two distinct phases in this model. Our work shows that these people died sometime in the range of AD 1520 to 1550, and that reeds were harvested in the range of 1550 to 1590. Now, this is significant because these data are coincident with the early Spanish occupation of Chincha. The death time range is consistent with the epidemics and famines of the mid 16th century. These data indicate that vertebrae were strung on reed posts during a very chaotic time in Chincha's history. Cholpas have red pigments and vertebrae on posts, but what treatments of the dead are documented in cysts? Data from one of the Sector B cysts paint a very different picture. The disarticulated bones of juveniles were placed in textile bundles and then deposited in the tomb. An adult male and female were wrapped in textiles. They were then stacked on each other in extended p p positions. And finally, they were deposited on top of three underlying reed posts that may have been part of a litter. Evidence for this type of deposition was not found in any of the cholpas in the survey zone. And lastly, none of the cysts in the survey zone contain human bones with red pigment or vertebrae on posts. How can we interpret these mortuary patterns? I want to turn now to some useful theoretical frameworks 
human cultures deal with the dead in different ways. In the Andes and elsewhere, mortuary practices can involve feasts and public ceremonies. Mortuary diversity has been the subject of anthropological interest for decades. Arthur Sachs and Lewis Binford treat mortuary practice as a marker of social difference. Ian Hodder and Mike Parker Pearson, among many others, think about mortuary behavior differently. They argue that mortuary practices are strategies for fulfilling certain interests. This is to say that mortuary practices are political in nature. I share this perspective. I draw from the theory of mortuary politics, which has been discussed by Catherine Verdery, by, by Catherine, Catherine Verdery and Jane Bykstra and Ken, Ken Nystrom. In this view, mortuary practices are ritual processes through which the social identities of the living and the dead were performed, reshaped, and contested. They involve the strategic use of the dead to achieve political goals. For instance, Bykstra and Nystrom find that the Inca took control of a cemetery associated with the Chachapoya culture in northeastern Peru. They then shifted local mortuary practices from disarticulated secondary burials to artificial mummification. The authors argue that the Inca subor sub subordinated the, the Chachapoya dead to rework ideologies of dissent and justified their new political order. The handling of dead bodies is a critical aspect of the mortuary process. Pre-modern Andean societies painted bones, wrapped the dead in textiles, and dismembered and reassembled bodies. What do post-mortem treatments of dead bodies tell us about the attitudes towards such bodies? In the words of jo Joanna Sofair, dead bodies are highly visible social resources that can be modified and Used, used by others. Furthermore, dead bodies are malleable media that can enable political action. For example, 16th and 17th century sources state that Inca royal mummies continued to live social lives after death. They were fed and cared for, consulted as advisors, and prominently displayed in public ceremonies that took place in the main square of Cusco. Inca rulers used mummies to claim power in the public eye. Postmortem modification transforms biologically dead bodies into socially and politically viable tools and symbols. As Catherine Verdery notes, Mortuary practices and dead bodies become especially important during times of social change. Imperial conquests can foster significant changes in societies that bring the politics of the dead to the fore. In the colonial period, the Spanish systematically destroyed Andean mummified ancestors and eradicated local mortuary practices that posed threats to their rule. Following Steve Wernke, I view conquest as a process that creates dynamic and improvised forms of political orders. Distinctions between local and non-local peoples become complex as land, cultural practice and identity become contested. In this context, new forms of society emerge. These ideas inform my models of the mortuary patterns, which I will now talk about. 
In the following model shown here, I suggest that cholpas were built for extended mortuary practices that entailed tomb reentry and post-mortem treatment of the dead. This model is informed by Arnold van G G G Gennep, Robert Hertz, Frank Salomon, and most recently, John Robb. At distinct stages in this model, the status of the dead transitioned into so something else. This is to say that through post-mortem modification, the dead were transformed into entirely new entities, perhaps capable of social engagement. Our data collectively demonstrate that in most cases, red pigment application and the mounting of vertebrae on posts likely did not occur immediately after death. Different identities may have been marked through lack of body modification or conversely through modification in the form of painting and reassembly, producing what Salomon says are differently dead folk. Changes in the status of the dead parallel changes in relationships among and between the living and the dead. I argue that Cholpas served as staging areas where the dead were initially d deposited for display and excarnation. The dead were likely not immediately buried. These claims are supported by several lines of data. Cholpas likely contain primary depositions of relatively complete flesh bodies because insect casings and high pro 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 proportions of smaller labile bones have been found. Interior benches and openings have been found in Cholpas. These finds collectively suggest that some of the dead were on display and accessible in these tombs for some time before burial. The more modestly constructed cysts were not used in the same way. Compared to cholpas, they were likely used over shorter time scales and designed to contain fewer people. Lastly, no evidence of post-mortem treatment of the dead was found in cysts suggesting that they were not targeted for extended mortuary practices. So far, we have demonstrated that cholpas and cysts are distinct tomb types that were used and built differently. These tombs were used over different periods of time and a new ritualized behavior the mounting of vertebrae on posts emerged in the late Inca period and early colonial period. These patterns indicate mortuary transformations that occurred during the Inca and Spanish conquests in Chincha. What about the dead who were placed in these tombs? Where did they come from? Now I turn to the ancient DNA pilot study, which shows that the Inca moved non-local peoples from the north coast to Chincha. What do we know about this Inca state policy? The empire forcibly moved non-local settlers known as Mitmakuna to the Chincha Valley. The Inca are one of the few societies that uprooted men, women, and children and resettled them away from their homeland. They selected a significant number of peoples from each province and moved these settlers to new destinations. These places varied in distance, but the state generally sought to put people in ecological zones similar to their home. Importantly, the Inca required Mitmakuna to retain their traditional textile styles. Forced resettlement was primarily done to mitigate threats to Inca 
authority and support the state economy. It is unclear where the Mitmakuna in the Chincha Valley came from, but 16th century sources give some clues. These sources state that the Inca moved Mitmakuna from the north coast to several valleys on the south coast. Our data, which I will discuss soon, coincide with these sources and ceramic, textile, and strontium data. These multiple lines of data demonstrate that the Chincha Valley was a targeted destination for state-sponsored resettlement of North Coast peoples. Most mortuary sites in the Mid Valley have ceramics that can be stylistically dated to the LIP and Inca period, and many of the ceramics are Chincha in style. We also found a few blackware vessels that are likely Inca period in date and North Coast in style. This finding coincides with previous research by D Dorothy Menzel that identified North Coast style pottery in the lower Chincha Valley. Textiles are one of the most important markers of group identity in the Andes. I worked with Colleen O'Shea to analyze more than 100 textiles from UC8 Tomb 1. Several stained textiles were used as bundles for holding decomposing bodies. Most textiles display plain weave structures with paired warps, which represent a salient feature of the North Coast Chimu style textiles. This pattern aligns with previous textile studies in the lower Chincha Valley that identified high proportions of textiles with this North Coast technique. To learn about where the dead came from, I collaborated with gen gen geneticists at UC Santa Cruz and Harvard to conduct a genome-wide study in Chincha. We sampled six people from two cholpas in two distinct mortuary sites. Direct C14 dates of four individuals from both tombs are consistent with the Inca period. Four of these people from one cholpa were previously sampled for strontium isotope analysis. This work revealed that they, li that they likely came from a coastal Andean region. Genome-wide analysis is a powerful method for studying the past. Ge genomic data are critical because they enable researchers to infer ancestries of ancient peoples in different regions with high precision. These data can demonstrate changes in ancestry over time in the same region or different ancestries coexisting in the same area. Both patterns can provide evidence for movement. Although ADNA is deeply insightful, it cannot by itself identify and explain human movement. Multiple lines of data are necessary to fulfill this goal. We integrated a DNA with multiple independent lines of evidence to explore the ancestries of the dead and where these people may have come from. We conducted this study in accordance with the wishes of local communities in Chincha. Indigenous peoples who lived near the tombs were consulted about this work. They conveyed an interest in learning about the past peoples of the Chincha Valley because all documented mortuary contexts have been visibly disturbed. This work was fully authorized with permits from the Ministry of Culture in Peru. Genome-wide sequencing of people from two cholpas was performed in the UC Santa Cruz Paleogenomics Lab. We first determined that none of these people are first or second 
degree relatives. This is significant because it suggests that ties of biological kinship may not have structured who was put in Cholpas. What were the social rules that structured membership in Cholpas? Then these data were compared to existing genome-wide data on pre-colonial period and modern Native American populations. The PCA plot shown here demonstrates that the tested people are genetically distant from other ancient people found nearby on the south coast. Instead, the genetic data fall within the genetic variation of ancient and modern peoples from the north and central coast of Peru. Further statistical analyses were conducted. The, the results show that the tested people shared similar genetic ancestry to with each other. We also determined that they are genetically most similar to ancient peoples found in El, El Brujo, a major site on the north coast that was occupied in part during the LIP and Inca period. This genetic data, this, this genetic evidence is consistent with colonial period sources and ceramic, textile, and strontium data from the middle Chincha Valley. These multiple independent lines of data best fit a model of Inca resettlement of North Coast peoples to the Chincha Valley. This is important for two reasons. First, this work provides a new integrated methodology for investigating human movement in complex societies. And second, Inca movement of non-local peoples significantly changed the Andean landscape. And yet, it has been difficult to prove in the Andes. These findings pr provide strong support for this state policy. All data from regional and site-specific spe site scales produce a rich picture of Mortre practice in the middle Chincha Valley. Here, I want to end with my complete interpretive narrative that integrates mortuary and genetic data. During the Inca period, local peoples continued using cholpas and continued applying red pigment to their dead. They abandoned cysts and mounted human vertebrae on posts. At least six people from two different cholpas were likely moved by the Inca from the north coast to the Chincha Valley. These people are not first or second degree relatives, which challenges notions that cholpas were kin-based family tombs. I argue that local peoples of the Middle Valley negotiated with the Inca to transform their mortuary practices and reshape their socio-political landscape in the face of conquest. As the Inca consolidated Chincha, widespread Cholpa use socially engineered more fluid communities and broader definitions of group identity that incorporated locals and non-locals. Private and or public ceremonies taking place in plazas and forecourts could have incorporated diverse peoples into social life to support these emergent social ties. At the same time, the shift from cis to cholpas under Inca rule enabled local peoples to establish and expand bases of authority and reinforce territorial claims. Inca conquest and the arrival of non-local peoples produced entirely new 
relationships of power among the living and the dead. In this new and contested environment, local peoples coordinated with each other to not only continue painting their dead, but also to interact with their dead in a new way by mounting vertebrae on posts. I suggest that this practice may have been performed to restore the potency of the dead and to reconstruct them as entirely different entities in an era of violent upheaval and in response to Spanish looting. This research provides a multiscalar and multidisciplinary approach to investigating mortuary politics. It, it expands upon imperialism studies to include a mortuary perspective on the dynamics of imperial conquest. My work shows that mortuary practices are political interfaces, interfaces through which interactions between local peoples and expansionist powers played out and whereby social change took place. Thank you very much. I just want to take a moment here to thank my mentors, colleagues, and everyone else listed on this slide for helping to make this project, this, this research, a reality. Thank you again, and thank you for your time. Thank you for that amazing uh, talk you put together for us, Jacob. Thank um, you. So we, we are a little bit running over time. Uh, I'm wondering if you would like to maybe take, you know, nine, nine or 10 minutes or so until 1210 to do uh, a Q&A, or if we could, we could run it shorter as well, if you would like. Um, Anything is fine. I mean, I'm, I'm here. I, uh, you know, we can, we can take a break if that's, if that's okay. what's best. Oh, I, I think we should just go ahead and, and, and run into the Q&A sure. here. Yeah, just to, sure. Um, so I, I know you want to pull up uh, the PowerPoint. We can. Yes. Just, yeah. Just let me uh, let me share screen right now. Um, OK. And is that working OK? Let's yes, that, that's working good. It's working fine. OK. Um, so one second Great. and I will get um, the chat set up here. Great. Okay, so everyone, I would ask you to, yes, okay, they should be able to now, to submit the questions in the chat, and they should go to me, um, and then I can read them out to Jacob. And if we need to reference something in the PowerPoint, he has that pulled up here. Yeah. And so while, right here. While, while people are, are working on that, uh, I did have a question about the, uh, one second, let me fix some things on my end, the uh, the cinnabar and the hematite uh, sure. that were used in the red pigment. Uh, is that something that would have been uh, available locally that would have been easily acquired or would that have to be brought in from, from further away? Yeah, so uh, for the hematite, uh, we actually found a source uh, in the valley, and I'm going to actually, I've got a slide uh, on that in the PowerPoint, so just give me a quick sec here. Um, but we actually found a hematite source in the valley, and it's uh, in the northeast, um, and my colleague Colleen and I were able to hike up there uh, and find it. Uh, sorry for that. So it's the uh, green triangle uh, in the uh, top right, so it's right there. And a photo of the uh, source is right here. There's the source. So, so that's one of the sources that was very likely used um, uh, for hematite. Uh, for the cinnabar, uh, that was very likely mined from the uh, the very well-known mine in Huancavelica, uh, which is further east. Um, and so currently right now, um, we have a few uh, samples um, being run at the fields right now. And we're using LA ICPMS. Um, and our goal with that work is to try 
and identify uh, the number of sources that were used for the pigment. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so we got some questions rolling in here. We have one okay. from uh, someone named Kent J in the chat. Uh, they have a question about uh, the faunal remains that might have been found. No mention of grave goods like camelids and cysts mm. uh, versus chulpas. Um, were, were there any found or anything like that? Great question. Yes, there were. Um, so we found uh, lots of, well, of a few camelid bones. Um, so there, uh, I don't have the, the precise counts, um, but there was one uh, camelid toe bone uh, found in UC8 tomb one that had cut marks uh, that that may have been um, butchering marks. Uh, we're not entirely sure, um, but we did. Uh, yes, so we we have found camelid bones um, uh, only in in Cholpas, uh so far in the cyst tomb that we dug. Uh, don't recall that we found too many. Um, I think we found maybe a few, but but not that many. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another uh, question from Michelle Young. Uh, she says, "Thank you for that fascinating and data-rich talk, Jacob. Uh, <laughs> I'm wondering if there are uh, ethnically Inca peoples buried in Chincha and how their practices might differ from these more local traditions and mortuary practice. Also." Uh, what is known about LIP mortuary traditions from uh, El Brujo, and how do they compare to what you are seeing in Chincha? Great questions. Um, so, ethnically, Inca people, we, we don't have any genetic data uh, that, that points to that. Um, so, right now, um, you know, based on the DNA data that we have, um, it, it seems that they're, they're from the, the the six people are from the north coast. We don't have a a local genetic signature yet, um, but we are analyzing more samples right now. So we we hope to get that. Um, LIP mortuary practices in El Brujo. Um, you know, I to be honest with you, I would I would have to get back to you on that. Um, I've read a bit about the site, but not per particularly um, the mortuary practices. Um, so I would definitely want to get back to you on that. Um, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Uh, we have one from Joyce Marcus here. How many people proved to be from uh, the North Coast and what was the degree of relationship among the North Coast people? So, so far, six people um, uh, right now uh, from two Chopas. Um, but again, we, we do, um, we do want to expand that sample, um, and, uh, and we, we will, um, and in terms of, uh, relationships, um, what was fascinating in the finds is that, um, is that the, the people that we analyzed, uh, they were not first or second degree relatives. Um, so that certainly, it seems, uh, challenges the notion that Cholpas were family tombs um, as of right now. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, three more questions here that we're going we're gonna to run through, okay. um, and then we'll, we'll probably call it there. Uh, so uh, one from Ryan Douglas-Smith saying they like your approach to mortuary politics. Um, much of the discussion focused on the use of mortuary spaces and the power they had in times of colonization, but what about during the LIP? Looking at one of your first Bayesian models, it appears that uh, Chulpa use increased dram dramatically during the LIP when cis tombs disappear. Uh, what's your interpretation uh, for the increased use of above ground tombs within the LIP? Within the LIP, well, well, both of them were used in that period. Mm -hmm. But of course, towards the end, yes, there is, yeah, there, there is, there, there seems to be more use of the chulpas. Um, in terms of uh, why is the uh, the the why are the chulpas being used in this period? Uh, there's several models that have that have been put forth for that. Um, I think what's a sort of popular model is that, uh, of course, as um, as we know the LIP was a post-collapse time period. Um, and so this, of course, was a period where um, there wasn't really any sort of state 
state framework in in place. Um, and so you have sort of fragmented um, peoples um, and what appear there 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 appear to be a, there appears to be a sort of balkanization of group identities. Um, and so what we're very likely seeing here is we have these uh, social groups that are trying to sort of to reify th their identities through chulpas and specifically through, um, again, these the uh, uh, above ground nature of the tombs is of course very key here that, that the dead were put on display. Um, and so in this sort of very chaotic, extremely violent period, um, that's pro that's that's probably one one of the reasons why tropas were used. Um, and in terms of space, yeah, I mean it's so we we haven't necessarily directly dated the four courts or the plaza spaces. Um, so it's it's very hard to say. Um, well, I I don't based on associated dates. It is Inca period, but again, um, with the spaces, they were very likely used before that as well. Um, and so in the future, um, it would be very, very nice to uh, to dig a few of these uh, spaces and see precisely when they were built and used. Thank you. Um, another question for Matthew Velasco. A uh, fascinating talk. Your discussion of dead body modification inspires uh, questions about modifications of the living body. Um, mm -hmm. Most most crania in your talk appear to have been unmodified. Um, are there any any, any ex exceptions? And if so, do you see any correspondences to other indicators of local or non-local origin, tomb type, etc.? Great question. Yes. Uh, so. Um... Yeah, in the talk there there weren't any cases, but um, but we uh, we closely looked at a sample of twenty three skulls, and in that sample um, we did note that seventeen had tabular modification, um, and some have evidence of pressure that was a, a, a applied in the front and back. And then we had some the other cases where the pressure was just applied in the back. Um, but beyond that, um, we don't have any isotopic data um, from those skulls. We would, we would like to get that. That would be very, very nice. Um, so uh, it would certainly be fantastic to, to, to try and try and explore um, if these modified skulls were local or non-local, and if the pigmented skulls, where are these people from? Are they from Chincha? Are they from outside of Chincha? And I'm very happy to say that we are. We do have DNA data from a couple pigmented skulls, um, and so that data is being processed right now, and. Um, that's going to be very exciting. Excellent. I think that also leads perfectly into our next question from uh, okay. Jennifer Larios, who asked, uh, thank you so much for the amazing talk. Um, any info on who was getting hematite versus cinnabar? Um, uh, and also, I guess, pigmentation in general as well. Are there uh, perhaps any differences in the materials found with them, different differences in health, um, et cetera? Ooh. Great question. Yeah. So um, let me let me go back to the slide on uh, on the pigment. Um, we've got the age sex back uh, breakdown here. So that's what's fascinating, right? Is that this this pigment uh, is found on multiple age and sex categories, um, and we're just now starting to learn more about who these pigmented people were. Um, and what's really really cool that I, I I did not have time to talk about is that there is one painted uh, skull that has cr cranial trauma. And I've got that slide right here. Uh, I had an extra slide just in case I would I was asked. So yeah, so on the on the left here, uh, right there. Um, so in in terms of health, um, off the top of my head, I don't believe um, we have health data on pigmented skulls. Um, 
we find them everywhere, of course, um, and they're only found in cholpas. They aren't found in cis. Um, so, you know, it's 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 hard to say who who these people were. But I think once we get the DNA data, we will start to learn more about them. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay, so it's about uh, well, it's one fifteen in Eastern Standard Time, twelve fifteen on my end. So I think we'll uh, start wrapping it up there. And I want to thank Great. you again so much for the amazing talk and taking the time to sit here and chat with us about this amazing work. Thank you so much.